Grüezi YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent again. Today we will go deep into the bowel of electronics. Fortunately, we will not see any blood. Everybody with weak nerves should immediately stop viewing and go to a makeup channel or at least one with cats or so. For the rest of us, we will build our own I2C device consisting of three ultrasonic sensors. Our device will exactly behave as every other I2C sensor. If a robot, for example, needs to know if he has to stop, he can ask our I2C sensor the distances of the three sensors and our homemade device sends this information back via the I2C bus. For the heart of the device we will use an A-Tiny 85. To build this device we have to dig into the I2C protocol, have to understand how to program AT tinies set fuses and debug the whole stuff using an oscilloscope and logic analyzers. Fortunately the oscilloscope is optional and the logic analyzer is not expensive if you know how to search on AliExpress. The know-how presented here can be used also for many other things, like using AT tinies for your own ideas or building other I2C sensors with other functions. It might even be useful to debug your next project if the I2C sensor does not work as expected. So let's start. First, I take three of the ultrasonic sensors and connect them to a breadboard. I use the single wire configuration. If you are not familiar with this topic, you can go first to my last video about ultrasonic sensors. Now I connect them to an ATtiny85. This small chip can be programmed with the Arduino IDE, but has only eight pins. On the breadboard and for the test I use the DIP version. In the sensor itself I use the SMD version because it is smaller and better looking. But let's now come back to the code. We need three libraries for our sensor project. First the new ping library from Tim Eckel. The latest versions are also ATtiny compatible. Thank you Tim. Then we need the TinyWire S library from Rambo. TinyWire S library means that the device using this library is behaving like a slave on the I2C bus. This is the normal behavior of sensors. The robot will be the master. For embedded computers I always use a watchdog. If you do not know this concept Feel free to go to my video about this topic. I enclose the link in the comment. After the definitions of the libraries, we can go on with the definition of the pins. This is a short task because the ATtiny only has 8 pins and 3 of them have special uses like VCC, ground and reset. Because we use the one pin configuration, we define the trigger and the echo pin equal. Here you see that the ATtiny has a slightly different pin numbering scheme than the Arduino. You find it in the datasheet of the chip. Here you see also that all pins can have multiple functions depending on your program. PP0 and PB2 for example, are dedicated to the I2C bus. It cannot be changed. The other three pins are fortunately just enough for our three sensors. If you need more pins, you can use an ATtiny84, which has 14 pins. All the rest is equal to the 85 chip. Next, we have to define our slave address. You can choose your own address from the range of 5 to 119. The rest is reserved. You can choose the birthday of your wife or your lucky number. The only restriction is that no other sensor must have the same address on the same bus. But because this is your sensor, you even can change your address if you encounter this problem. 
unless you did, as I do, use an SMD chip. This is why I checked the I2C addresses of our usual sensors used in Arduino projects and I choose 8 for my project. One last remark on the I2C addressing. It uses 8-bit addresses but the last bit is used to indicate data direction. So the address range is only 7 bits. Now we are ready to initiate the wire connection and enable the watchdog. I choose its byte time as half a second. You can change it if your loop takes longer. The method wire.onRequest waits for a request from the master and then calls the defined function. In our case it calls the transmit function. The tiny wire library can only transfer one bit at a time. The users, and that's we, have to care about the rest. The rest means we have to create some sort of message format. In our case we have three sensor data to be transferred. Because we only need short distances for our robot I decided that 254 cm is the biggest distance the sensor can measure. So we can use one byte for one sensor reading. To distinguish between which reading is from which sensor, we could also transfer the number of the sensor together with the data itself. This would result in 6 bytes to be transferred. But this is not necessary if we always send the data in the same sequence. In order to synchronize the sender and the receiver, I use a header byte. I choose to use 255. 255 centimeters is never transferred because our sensor has only a range of 254 centimeters. What a coincidence! If you need to transfer bigger data packets, I suggest that you watch my video about my remote control. I also include the link below in the comments. The sketch in the robot now can wait till it gets a 255. Then it knows that the next three bytes are left, middle and right distance of our do-it-yourself sensor. The loop itself is simple. It reads the three sensors and stores it in an array and at the end it feeds the watchdog. So the sensor always reads the three distances. Only if the master is interested in the result it initiates the transfer and gets the latest readings. So let's now look at the timing. Here we see the signal of the first sensor. As discussed in the last video we see first the trigger and afterwards the signal of the receiver. The overall measurement takes about one millisecond for a short distance and the sensor fires every 80 milliseconds. Sensor 2 and 3 measure in between the two signals. So one measuring cycle takes about 80 milliseconds. This does not seem long but in a self-balancing robot's life this is like forever. It needs much less for his whole loop to keep its stability. If we would block it for such a long time it would not be able to stand. This is the main reason why I built this sensor. Now let's look at the time for the I2C communication. It needs only one millisecond to transfer all three sensor values which is 100 times faster than the reading of the sensors. Job done. Let's now go on and have a short look into the I2C communication. The SCL line creates a clock and does not carry any information. The data bits are transferred on the SDA line. Here you see how it looks on the oscilloscope. This view is ok for debugging if you just want to know if you have a signal and if the signal has the typical look of an I2C connection. To dig deeper some oscilloscopes provide data decoding options. 
I do not use it often because the screens of these devices are too small and the handling is complicated. Fortunately, logic analyzers were created to fill this gap. Salea did a great job of building small logic analyzers which are connected by a simple USB cable to your PC. To test our new sensor, I connect it via four lines to an Arduino Mega, which simulates the master. It will be replaced later by the micro of the robot. Let's look at the communication used by this software. We see that packets are transferred every 200 milliseconds. This is due the delay 200 in the master sketch of our Arduino Mega. The packets itself are very short, as we saw on the oscilloscope. We can now zoom into one data packet and see that its content is as expected. Every byte is led by our address number 8. The bytes are 255, 205, 212, 180. If you look at the serial monitor below, you see that these three readings correspond with the values read by the Arduino Mega. And the first byte, of course, is the header byte. You can change the settings of the display to see the full bits transferred over the line. Please keep in mind that the readings are in decimal. So our do-it-yourself I2C sensor is ready to be used. As mentioned before, I routed a small PCB which connects the three sensors with the AT Tiny and provides a header for the connection to the master. But wait, I forgot something. How was this program transferred to this small AT Tiny chip? This is different than to transfer it to your Arduino, but still quite simple. First, you have to install the AT Tiny environment in your IDE. Then you have to buy a USB ASP programmer and connect it to the respective AT Tiny pins. Many sources in the internet show how it is done. Then you can program your AT Tiny the same way as an Arduino can be programmed. I built again a small PCB with a socket to do this comfortably. Insert the chip into the socket, select the respective chip and press Upload. The clock rate and source are not important here. Now you can take the chip and move it back to your do-it-yourself sensor. I do not want to go into details here, but the first time you use an AT Tiny, you have to also burn the bootloader. This does not really burn a bootloader, but it sets the different fuses in the chip. This has only to be done once per chip. To do this, you have to select the clock rate and the source. Please select an internal clock source, otherwise the chip will not work without the crystal. Maybe I will make a video about that topic which will include the fuses how to set them and how to remove them using a high voltage programmer. Please write in the comment if you are interested. This is all for now. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. Bye!